Okay, all right. I guess we are live. So let's see here. Let me lower this a little bit. Stand by. Okay, that's better. That's better. Okay. It is March 28th. It's 5.32 in the morning, two minutes late. Sorry, they asked me anything. We'll go ahead and kick this off. So I've got the questions called up on my phone here from the private Facebook group, as well as from the BTWB squad. And we'll go ahead and here we go. So let's see. Hope everybody's morning is off to a wonderful start. The first thing I'm going to start with is we've got a bunch of questions, obviously, that I'm going to cover. But one of the things written was just a really nice shout out. It wasn't even a question. So I'm going to start off with that shout out. So here we go. This is from Brian T. It says, no question for the coach tonight. Just a sincere thank you. Over the last three to four years before finding CrossFit Lynchpin, I spent the majority of that time in a local affiliate that offered the daily Lyft plus Metcon programming. I was constantly beat up, was not seeing a large improvement in my overall fitness and growing increasingly frustrated with trying to cram so much into a one hour class. Just over a year ago, I decided to cancel my affiliate membership and work out exclusively in my home gym that I had been investing in. I went through two popular quote unquote, 60 minute online programs that adhere to the same Lyft plus Metcon philosophy, only to find myself constantly struggling to fit it all into the 60 minute window. I began to question if it was the CrossFit methodology that I was getting burned out on and not necessarily the programming that I was following. So I took a break and did some standard powerlifting and strength training for a short while. Somehow I got introduced to the CrossFit, to, excuse me, to Lynchman Conversations, the podcast about a year ago. And then I got introduced through that to one of the very not random podcasts. I enjoyed them both immensely and felt connected with Coach and Boz, even though I only knew them through a podcast. And the knowledge that they shared resonated with me and kept bringing me back. I continued resisting to give CrossFit Lynchman a try because I had been brainwashed to think that as an everyday individual trying to increase my fitness, that I needed all the extra volume. One day something clicked and I decided to give Lynchman a try and I'm so glad I did. That was October 31st, 2023. The programming is beautiful. It's helping me hit new PRs even in my late 40s. I feel my fitness is increasing. I look and feel better. I'm no longer beat up every day and I look forward to the workouts. And while I'm not a huge Facebook fan, quite frankly, who is? I enjoy the online community. But most importantly, it has reinvigorated my belief and appreciation for the methodology. This stuff works. Thanks for helping me fall in love with it again. Very cool. That is pretty darn awesome. So that that fires me up. And with no further ado, let's dive right in with my um, signature annoying sipping of coffee. So I apologize to all the audio listeners. It's 530 in the morning. You know, come on. Uh, all right, this one is from Patrick S., longtime member, Patrick S., a different Patrick S., not me. It says, Coach Pat, you mentioned in Very Not Random 155 that you had to put together a workout, quote unquote, spur of the moment to do while caring for your daughter when she was sick. Oh my goodness, yes. And for like the however long it was that she had colic, like 10 months. While caring for your daughter while she was sick, it was something like five rounds of two minutes in the air runner and 10 D-ball bear hug squats with the 150. Yes, I remember this one. And I know you mentioned other times you had to program workouts when you were short on time just to get your fitness in. Yes. So have you ever done any of these workouts and realized that you liked it so much that you chose to keep it in your back pocket to program later for us? And if so, which ones? Good question. Um I mean, geez, probably is, is the short answer, probably. But I think actually what happens a lot in those situations is, first of all, I can't shut my brain off for this stuff anyway. Like my brain always just is somehow thinking about strength and conditioning or the human body or like just, it's cool and also annoying. And in a lot of those times, I think if I modify something because I'm short on time or the schedule screwed up or whatever it happens to be, that just helps me... Um, and I do something a little bit different, it's almost like I tested a little something and maybe the whole workout doesn't make its way into something, but a, a piece of it does or the essence of it or something like that. I'll give you an example from yesterday. 
so yesterday was supposed to be, you know, the shoulder presses and then the death by shuttle sprints, right? And so yesterday just was got a little hectic, you know, three kids in life got a little hectic. And I was home with the little girl who doesn't really let me leave her side and wife had to take off to get the boys. And then as my wife was walking out the door to get the boys, Lane, our little girl who will be three in June, she like wanted to go with Emily, with mom. And I was like, oh, wow. If she actually does want to go with mom and not stay home with me, I've got a short window of time. She had to go pick up the boys at school. So it's going to be like 25 minutes round trip. So she, yep, she wanted to go with mom. So I was like, this is it. This is my time to go get in the death by shuttle sprints, which I would have loved to do and actually really like and was looking forward to. But, you know, I've had that total hip replacement surgery in November, doing great from it, doing fantastic. But one thing I haven't really messed around with yet is a lot of stop rotation deal and that's a lot of the death the, the, the shuttle sprints the 10 meter shuttle sprints so i was like uh, i'm ready to do that but not in like a real high intensity sort of an effort like part of just regular workout i'm cool with that but i'm like i don't know if that's actually the smartest idea so i modified real quick in my head it's like here's what i'm going to do i'm going to hop in the air runner and i'm just going to do 30 seconds of running 30 seconds of walking that's it. And I'm going to do that until my wife pulls back in the driveway. And however long it is, is however long it is. Because I figured over the course of doing a, a death by 10 meter shuttle sprint, let's say I get into the round of, you know, whatever, 16 or something like that. You're probably, you know, you're running more in the later minutes, very little in the early minutes. So you're probably running maybe half the time. So I was like, okay, half the time, 30 seconds of running, 30 seconds of walking. And, you know, I'm just going to look at the clock and the air runner and built-in warm-up the 30 seconds of running in the first few minutes won't be that fast i'll start to feel good it'll become quicker and quicker and i'll just have to hold on for dear life and it'll be a you know a one-to-one -one work to rest ratio and let's just see how far i get before my wife's car pulls back in the driveway and that's what i did and i think i was on the air runner for 23 minutes okay doing that 30 seconds on 30 seconds off and it was appropriately nasty it was you know, very similar to the workout of the day, yet slightly different. Yet, I don't know if we've ever done that exact same workout for that time domain and all that stuff. So all those things are just like useful data points, useful data points. So I hope that answers your question. Um, LVOC, any plan to promote Lynchpin more at affiliates? That's a great question, my friend. Many people here in affiliates have the same kind of story, being burned out and injured with the classic lift super heavy, do a workout at 100% every day. And then they have stories of how they actually improved in both health and performance after switching to linchpin, you know, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, uh, man, it's a great question. It's also um, it's bad on me uh, for not promoting it more for affiliates. Anybody who's been listening to linchpin conversations, which worked for what? This is like episode number 400 and almost 50. So there's been a lot of them. Um, probably knows that my heart and soul is maniacally and solely focused on creating the most effective and efficient strength and conditioning workouts from a minimal, minimalist perspective, period, end of story. Like that's my all-encompassing passion. And then building and creating and caring for a wonderful community. That's it. Um, I wouldn't label myself as a profoundly talented person businessman or promoter or marketer um so i mean i'm sure there's so much more i could be doing to let affiliates know what, what lynchpin has and i just don't do a very good job at it but you know there is a lynchpin private track for gym owners and we do have a nice number of gyms on there but i and but they've grown just organically i don't promote it at all and if any if you want to point an affiliate owner towards it have them go to crossoutlynchpin.com They'll see the information in the individual private track. There's also a link that you can click there for gym owners, and it gives them all the information for that. Or if you click the link in our Instagram bio, same deal. It'll take them to the page about the individual Lynchpin private track. But on that page, there's a place to click if you're a gym owner, and it gives you all the information about that. And you're right. And I, I will say this. Uh, what is next week? Next Friday, so a week from tomorrow, I actually do have an interview planned with an individual trainer at an affiliate that lived that exact same life, switched over to linchpin, 
things are going fantastic. And I'm going to interview that person next Friday about his experience, what it was like to try to talk the owner into switching over to Lynchpin and all that good stuff. So since I'm doing that on a Friday, and I don't really post content on Friday, we do these Ask Me Anything's on Thursdays. I do the other live videos on Tuesdays. I'll record that on next Friday, and I'll probably post it as Tuesday's video. So within the next seven to 10 days, there should be a video coming up about this exact topic, and maybe that's something that you could share with uh, affiliate owners, but you're right. I do a very poor job of marketing and promotion, a very poor job. I just figure if we're making people feel better, making them fitter, faster, and stronger, not lying to them, that the word will get out. And it has, but I, I could probably amplify that in some way. And I, I'm not good at it. I'm sorry. So, okay, let's see. Next question from Keith B. If you wanted to lose 20 pounds by summer, would you continue with the linchpin workout of the day and just change your diet? Or would you modify your workouts in some way? I just want to look good in a swimsuit, quote unquote, asking for a friend. So you can most, well, here's the short answer. It's nutrition, period, end of story. You could not work out between now and summer. Not do a single darn workout, then just live your normal life. And if you were dialed in and unwaveringly disciplined with the appropriate nutritional plan for you, you could most likely achieve your goals. Now, where are you defining summer and how many weeks out is that? And then you do the math as to how much weight would you have to lose per week? And is that a healthy number? That's obviously wrapped in the conversation. But point being, if you want to lose weight, you want to lose 20 pounds, you have some sort of goal, man, you could power lift, you could just be a runner, you could just do gymnastics. You could do linchpin. It's going to come down to the decisions that are made in the kitchen, period, end of story, 100%. And so I'm always a big fan of Optimize Me Nutrition. She's no nonsense. Go ahead and check her out. E.C. Sinkowski. I don't get anything for saying that. I don't get any reference. I don't get any money. I don't get anything. I just think her stuff works and it's not silly fluff and or clickbait. So that would be my highest recommendation to you. But you can still do lynch, my friend, 100%, but it's going to be locked down in the kitchen, unquestionably. Okay. Um, Marcus M. I'm currently doing the very not random strict pull-up program in addition to the daily linchpin workouts. What's the best way to add in the extra strict work? If the daily workout also has upper body pulling in it, should I prioritize the workouts and treat the pull-up work as accessories and do it at the end of the session? Or should I do the pull-ups uh, or should I do the pull-ups first, knowing that there will be any extra pulling exercises in the main workout, even though they might suffer? So Marcus, I would also post this question as just a general standalone question in the Lynchman private Facebook group and in the squads feature in BTWB, because you'll get real input from real members of the Lynchman community who lived this life, and you'll have their lessons learned, which is awesome. But I've read those and seen those myself. Anyone who's unfamiliar with what he's talking about, Very Not Random has a bunch of cycles. You can go to verynotrandom.com, um, programs to get your first strict pull-up, strict handstand push-up, get your first uh, bit of handstand walking, um, toes to bar, you know, all, all kinds of really awesome, like get your first this and get your first that, it's there. And there's also a really good 1.5 mile run program that I created with Chris Henshaw. So you can check those out, they'll upload your BTWB calendar, the app on your phone, you program them in. They're actually really cool. In a world of nonsense and junk of things that don't work, those cycles are really cool. Um, and they get the, your first strict pull-up is probably the most popular one. Either one of the options that you mentioned is totally fine. I'm sorry, that's probably an unsatisfying answer. But if your focus, your primary focus is I want to improve that strict pull-up capacity, then I would do it before the workout. Let it get your best effort. Let yourself be totally fresh. And then, yeah, if the workout on that day happens to also have upper body pulling and that workout suffers a little bit because you did walk into it with a bit of fatigue of the same muscle groups, it's okay if that particular workout suffers that day. It's okay because you have a focus and it's okay to give that focus, that attention for a bit. You're still going to get benefit out of doing the workout, even if you're a little bit slower on it because you're fatigued in the upper body. So that would be my primary one. If that's your goal, 
go ahead and, and do that first. And good luck. People have really cool results from that program. Cohen D, what would you recommend for people who can only do one to two of the linchpin workouts a week due to training for other sports, work, or health issues? Which of the five workouts of the week should they do? Great question. So, Cohen, we have answered this in a bit of a different way. You're on the lower side with one to two workouts. So the question that I could answer before, now we'll point you to this episode of Lynchman Conversations, is somebody who's, it's very common to hear like, hey, I can only work out three times a week. What are the three that I should do? So it's um, the kind of the Lynchman Conversation, Lynchman Conversation number 128, the name of that episode is Help, I Can Only Work Out Three Times a Week. And in that episode, which I recommend that you listen to, the recommendation was absolutely make one of those three workouts the heavy day. Get yourself a classic heavy day in there. And then for the other two workouts, it would be great if you're just interested in still improving your fitness as much as you can to make one of them. Yes, it'd be nice to look at you know gross movement patterns and time domains and loadings and all that stuff like for sure. But if you're just times are tough and you want to actually get into the gym, one classic heavy day, then one of the other remaining two workouts would be a workout that when you see it, you love it. It's going to be, you don't have to twist your arm to get in the gym and do it. It's going to be fun. You're going to have a blast. Choose that one. And then the other one, if you're really interested in, you know, bumping your fitness up, make, choose one that has movements or loadings or something in it that's put you a little bit on the struggle bus. Okay, because it's, you know, working your deficiencies is so beneficial to your overall improvement as for your work capacity and your fitness. Classic heavy day, one that you love and one that doesn't put such a big smile on your face. That's a good starting point for three. And again, if you had the strength and conditioning IQ to look at which of these are below parallel, which of these are overhead to make sure you're getting in the gross movement patterns, that would be a great way to do it as well. And now if you're saying you can only do two a week, I'm still going to say make one of those the heavy day, okay? Make one of those the classic heavy day for sure. And then for the other one, um, I would maybe try to choose one that has, I wouldn't choose like a single modality deal if that's possible. So if you're choosing one classic heavy day and you're only going to do one of the workout a week period, <clears throat> generally speaking, I wouldn't want it to be like grace, you're just going to do clean and jerks or just randy or something like that. Like I would want to see something that has maybe three or four movements in it. And it's a 15 to 20 minute workout so that you're going to get a lot of work for a lot of different musculature done. Maybe you're going to go below parallel. You're going to pull from overhead. You know, it's Cindy. It's, it's, it's something like that where there's three to four different movements and you're going for 15 to 20 minutes. That would be my other selection as well. If you could only do two and then hopefully little by little, you get to come back. But here's the other thing that I would say. If you're saying you can only work, you know, you said health reasons, so that's that's a different deal. But if it's schedule, I think people always think they need so much more time than they do to actually get in a workout. You know, if you were limited to, you had 25 minutes, three or four times a week, and that's all you had, 25 minutes, you could get in a lot of work in 25 minutes, three to four times a week. And you could do it in ways that, you know, again, not ideal, but had built in warm ups. You know, again, a death by protocol. One of those 25 minutes, you grab a pair of, you know, 50 pound, 40 pound, 30 pound, 25 pound dumbbells, and you start a death by thruster. One thruster the first minute, two the second minute, three the third minute, four the fourth minute. You know, for I know, still a minute five, you're only doing five. You're starting to get yourself loose and warmed up, and then the workout gets real after that. You don't need 25 minutes for a death by thruster workout, or there's many other protocols like that. Or what I did yesterday on the air runner, 30 seconds on, 30 seconds off, 30 seconds on, 30 seconds off, and allowing myself during those 30 seconds on to gradually increase the pace as it went on because time was crunched. Again, that's the whole point of linchpin, the whole point of the community, the whole point of these conversations of, you know, this is podcast number 440, whatever. If you do listen to all these things, your strength and conditioning IQ will skyrocket and you will, I promise you, understand how to look at the time that you have available, how your body's feeling, the gear that you have is accessible, 
and you will be able to make something fit darn near any time domain and you will get really fit doing it. Again, all you need to do is do that and not eat like a drunken pirate and things will go really, really well. That is an absolute promise. Okay, let's see. Now the questions from the BTWB squad. Okay, here we go from Matt O. If you could program a workout for the games, what would it be? And it can't be a repeat. You know, I don't know exactly, but I can give you a rough, and this is this is rough. I'd have to polish it up a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. But it would be something where it ends on a monostructural component where you just have to send it, okay? And you're sending it or not sending it um, determines your placement and the movement before it, it pre-fatigues what's going to happen, but the movement before it, everyone's kind of generally at the same pace. So that doesn't confer a huge advantage. That's going to be won or lost on the monostructural component where you can, you need to dance with the devil. What's that saying? Um, I can't remember who said it, but something like fatigue makes cowards out of all of us, right? or exhaustion makes cowards out of all of us. It'd be some workout like, get them to like, an, like a legitimate 400 meter track, like a collegiate track and get a barbell on the track that maybe weighs 135. I don't know, we've had to figure out what, what the appropriate loading is. And then for those games athletes, they're gonna do, you know, 15 or 20 thrusters. Not so much, that I don't want anyone to have to put the barbell down. I want them all to cycle a fast, miserable 15 to 20 thrusters at a weight that they can do, but they don't want to do. And then they drop that barbell. And so basically the workout would be that set of thrusters and a 400 meter dash around the track, period, end of story. That's the whole workout. There's nothing other than that. And they're all going to drop that barbell at roughly the same time so that what it comes down to is a maniacal diabolical suffer fest of misery on the track for a 400 meter dash, which is just long enough that it's an absolute slice of hell, but just short enough that you cannot slow down because it's going to be determined by a couple of seconds who wins this thing. And you have to run so much faster than you want with your legs and lungs that are on fire from what you just did with a simple movement. It would be something like that, something like that. And again, I'd have to rework that a lot, but it wouldn't be something complicated, I can tell you that. Okay, uh, let's see. Oh, I didn't see this comment here on YouTube from Betsy. Man, I wish my local off-brand CrossFit gym would follow Lynchman. They follow a different, very popular giant in the CrossFit space, and I just couldn't deal with the overload of programming. I hear that all the time. Yes, very, very true. Okay, Justin D, what's your favorite hobby outside of the fitness realm? <sighs> Hobbies, those are a thing, right? So people have those. So I must admit I'm in a phase of life that's not fun regarding hobbies, um, just how busy with things are with the kids and all that. But what I do enjoy doing and I look back, I very much look forward to doing again is two things. The number one that comes forward to me is Spanish for a hobby. I love the Spanish language. I think it is absolutely a beautiful, beautiful language that over the course of my life I've had times where I spoke it really well and times where there was a lot of rust on it and I don't speak it very well, which is the phase that I'm in right now. And I don't have anybody in the local area that speaks Spanish that I know, or I'd get coffee with them three times a week and just have them talk. And that would be awesome. But um, Spanish, I look back, I look forward to getting back into just practicing Spanish, speaking Spanish, finding a meetup group or, you know, a tutor or something like that. That would be awesome. And then the other thing is archery. I've got a really nice bow that I love to shoot and with my background in the military. I really love shooting, but traditional shooting with firearms is expensive. So archery is really cool. And, you know, I've got a target in the back backyard that unfortunately I haven't sunk some arrows into that thing in far too long. Um, but I look forward to doing that. And it'd probably be a good idea if I got out into the woods with the bow, but I'd have to find some people that are into that around here as well. But yeah, Spanish and archery would be the two things. 
And let's see here from FXTT. What do you think of High Rocks? So for anyone who's unfamiliar with it, High Rocks is a, it occurs indoors. It's an event where I believe it is eight rounds, so to speak. Let's see, let's say that there's eight stations, okay? One station is like a thousand meter row, another station is like a thousand meter ski erg. There's a sled push, there's a sled pull. There's a walking lunge with a sandbag on your back. There's wall ball shots. There is a farmer's carry. There's burpee broad jumps. And I might be forgetting something else, but there's eight stations. And before each station, you run 1,000 meters. So you run 1,000 meters, you do something else. You run 1,000 meters, you do something else. And I think over the course of the event, you wind up running just about five miles and then doing all the other stuff as well. What is my opinion of it? I think it's really cool and awesome. And I know some people that have done it, they've had a great time. It's nice to do something that's not, you know, CrossFit, even though it's certainly CrossFit and has that feel. Gotcha. You know, it's mixed modality and all that stuff. But it's not like you've got to squat clean 100 kilos or you're not fit. It's just, you know, relatively, the, the sled pushes and pulls are heavy. Don't get me wrong. But it's, you know, generally uh, lighter loading, but you still need to be fit and strong. It's more on the endurance side. I think it's really cool. I think it's fun. I think it's awesome. I love to see people doing it. Uh, I would like to do one myself. I think it'd be fun. And I give it two thumbs up, personally. My two cents on that. And also from FXTT, does being a good coach mean programming? And on the contrary, knowing how to program well, does that make you a good coach? So, not necessarily. Well, here's the easy one. Simply knowing how to program well does not make you a coach. You know, when I interviewed Chad Vaughn, who's an Olympian, and he coaches people on, you know, Olympic weightlifting, we interviewed him very not random. He said something, and I didn't say anything during the show, because, you know, we're interviewing him. It was about highlighting him. But, man, what he said resonated with me, which he's like, he feels uncomfortable when people call him coach because he feels like that's a term that should have some reverence to it. And, and it means a lot in his head. And when people call him that, like he, he feels kind of uncomfortable. Like, I don't know if I really earned that man that resonated with me. So, you know, a lot of people call me coach in linchpin and never ask them to do it. Um, and, you know, whenever I meet somebody in real life and they come like, Hey coach, I'm like, you know, I always int introduce myself. as like, you know, Call me Pat, uh, because I kind of feel that same way about that that term. That the term coach is somewhat on this on this pedestal, uh, and there's a lot that goes that goes into that. I mean, we can have an entire discussion as to maybe what that is, you know. And I didn't really ever flesh it out in my mind, but I can tell you that uh, that it's up there. And what Chad said resonated with me. But to simply answer your question, like, hey, somebody knows how to program well, does that make them a coach? No. No, it makes them, you know, a programmer. And I suppose you could be an excellent coach and not know how to program. Honestly, you know, if there's a billion things in strength and conditioning that you need to be good at. And, you know, if somebody else is excellent at programming and you were great at, you know, being a coach through cultivating your community, inspiring your members, you know, checking out movement, making people better you know, wanting a little bit more for people than they want themselves, always pushing them just appropriately. Like there's a whole lot that goes into that, that word of what a coach is. And you could do that without being a genius at programming. You really, really could. And like I said, and the other side is true. You could be amazing at programming and not a coach, you know? And so there's certainly overlap there, but the two are, they have the potential to be distinct as well. But like I said, what Chad said, it, um, it resonated with me because for some reason in my mind, like that word coach is, it's a powerful word. It's a powerful word. Uh, let's see. Alexander W. After listening to Lynchman Conversations number 445, I'm wondering if there's a distinction between high intensity and dancing with the devil intensity. <laughs> I've done workouts at high intensity, heavy breathing, tough grinding out the reps, etc., but I think I throttle back before I need, before I need to, you know, such as that story you told about coaching Fran really hit home with me. Could you give your thoughts on this and how often 
do you recommend trying to cross that threshold to to meet the devil? So you're right. I mean, let's call high intensity anything, you know, um, 70 percent or above right this is an oversimplification i realize that but if you have 100 percent to give and we chunked it up into three areas zero to 33 percent is low intensity 34 percent to 66 percent is moderate intensity 67 percent to 100 percent is high intensity well you can see that even in those three chunks you have a range right because even if you're in the high intensity chunk and that's anywhere from 67 percent to 100 percent well there's a difference between going 75%, 85%, or 95%. They're all high intensity efforts. They're not moderate, they're not low, but one's like a, you know, <clears throat> everything I have in the tank near blackout experience. And the other is I pushed really hard and I kept myself quite uncomfortable, but I didn't quote unquote dance with the devil. So yes, there is a range even in there. And to be honest with you, you know, Chris Spieler has a really good line. I'm going to mess it up a little bit, but his, his line is something like 80% effort, 100% of the time will get you 90% there. I'll say it again. 80% effort, 100% of the time will get you 90% there. I like that a lot. Pump the brakes. That is an oversimplification. So don't be like, okay, gotcha. Well, that's 80% effort I should do all the time. And Pat just said 80% effort would fall into high intensity. So now Pat just said high intensity, 100% of the time, we'll get you 90% there. No, 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 no. Okay, that's it. It's an oversimplification of what could be like a one hour conversation, but you just have to tell something 10 seconds real quick in an elevator. What his general point was is like, you don't need to go 100% all the time. That was the point, okay? Because that was the old school what I grew up in CrossFit thinking that you had to do it, that every day had to be a just you left yourself wiped out on the floor with nothing to give sort of an effort. We've all learned the hard way. I should say we've all plenty of us that had our eyes wide open learned the hard way. That ain't that ain't what you should do. That's a bad call. So high intensity effort has value undoubtedly as does moderate and low. OK, so again, what Chris said is an oversimplification. So I was hesitant to even say because sometimes people don't want to understand the nuance and the context and the layers of the onion. They just run with something that's just shorthand. So, but if you do want to work on, so if you just, you know, if on your high intensity days, again, do your low intensity days, do your moderate intensity days. But if on your high intensity days, you're, you know, ping ponging between 80 and 90%, you're going to be fine, my friend. You're going to be fine. Um, you're going to be fine. I don't even know how else to say it. Now, if we're talking about, do you maybe have some more to squeeze out? Yeah. Yeah. You might, you might, and it might, it might be physical or it might just be mental of you actually learning where your limits are as an athlete, which there's value to. Okay. And that did have value. My old, you know, occupation of the military and things like that, like really knowing what your limits were and finding where you broke. That was important. Um, it's less so in the regular civilian world. But what you could do if you wanted to see, if you wanted to give yourself like a, we could, we could establish like some sort of a dance with the devil protocol. And it would probably be wildly popular with some people because people like stuff like this. And the easiest thing to do would be with a, like a, a simple workout. Like I said a second ago, maybe you're going to have the Fran weight on the barbell, right? And you're going to do this once a week you're going to do let's just say that you can do 15 thrusters at 95 pounds and you have an, an echo bike in your garage you're going to do 15 thrusters at 95 pounds you're going to hop on the echo bike and you're going to do um one minute of calories on the echo bike but you're not going to go bonkers right away you're going to pedal let's say at um 60 RPMs, which sounds very reasonable, right? Great. And you mark down how many calories you got. Next week, you're going to do the 15 thrusters. You're going to hop on. You're going to pedal at 65 RPMs. How many calories did you get in that one minute time domain? The next week, 15 thrusters, pedal at 70 RPMs. The next week, 75 RPMs. There's going to be some 
time as you creep over the weeks that you, at first, increasing by five RPMs each week, you're not going to meet the devil right away. But there'll be some time where you increase it by five RPMs and you don't meet the devil, but you see him on the horizon with a pitchfork and he's waving at you. And he's saying, you're not at my door yet, but you're in my neighborhood and we'll talk soon. And then the next week you bump it up five RPMs and he's a little closer. And then eventually you'll meet him and you'll try to surpass it. And you'll find the point if you keep doing that, that you crash and burn. When you find that point that you crash and burn, you've built up to it over the course of weeks, you could then work yourself back percentage wise and figure out what's just 90% of that, right? And then you could do 90% of that for 75 seconds instead of 60, right? And slowly build up the tolerance or for 90 seconds if you could, and then go back to the 60 seconds and see, could you hold that a bit more? And then you could also play the other game where find out where you crashed and burned. Maybe you crashed and burned at trying to hold 80 RPMs. And then you could say, okay, I couldn't hold 80 RPMs for, um, for 60 seconds. I crashed and burned after 35. So I'm gonna hold 80 RPMs for 30 seconds, rest one minute and do it another 30 seconds. And then I'm gonna little bit by little bit, keep those two 30 second windows at 80 RPMs and decrease that rest period from one minute to 45 seconds. And the next week decrease it to 30 seconds until eventually those meet and maybe you can hold it for 80 RPMs. And this is just off the top of my head, but there's countless ways that you could massage this and play with this with different movements, different loadings, different time domains, but you could find some measurable, observable, repeatable way that's simple that you could find your limits and threshold for pain and allow yourself to bump into it safely every now and then. So the Dance with the Devil program, patent pending from Lynchpin. Okay. Is this the final question? No, two more, okay. This one is from Stuart L. When do you know that an injury is more than a simple quote unquote rest and recover? And, and it's actually, you need to see a specialist. In our household, we joke that most ales can be cured with some combo of one, drink water, two, take ibuprofen, three, get rest, and four, change your socks. <laughs> but sometimes there is more going on. Do you have any guidelines for when an injury requires more intervention? How do you know How do you know when it's time to get your hip surgery? Oh, great question. So here's what I would recommend. Stuart, check out Very Not Random, episode 141. It's entitled an orthopedic surgeon's opinion on squats and deadlifts. Great episode with Dr. Sean Rocket, fantastic human being. And I don't want to oversimplify what he's saying, but he was he was kind of saying that like there was a difference between, you know, you've got some pain, you've got a strain, a, a nagging injury, and then he had some things like you're working out and you hear something uh, with the pain that you feel. You hear a pop you hear a tear, like there's a sound that you can hear out of your body. Like that's an immediate red flag to like, you might want to have somebody check you out and not just give it a little bit of rest and TLC. So he had some really cool tips and tricks in that episode that I think would serve you really well. So listen to Very Not Random, number 141. And then final question from Michael G. For the workouts on March 25th and March 27th with front squats and shoulder presses, how did you decide on the weights being 60% of our one rep max? I enjoy the standardized weights with named workouts, but I do like the percentage of one RMs being individualized to the athlete. Um, cool. So again, probably another unsatisfying answer, but through a lot of trial and error over the years, because most of the literature and exercise science and strength and conditioning and whatnot it wasn't on mixed modality, high intensity training. It just wasn't. It was somebody who was just a runner. They were just a lifter and nothing else. They were just a gymnast. It wasn't these hybrid athletes trying to do everything. They weren't lifting weights at a high heart rate. That just didn't exist. And so when you go to a lot of classic lifting charts that you should do this many reps at this percentage for this total volume, this many sets, it's not for somebody who is into functional fitness and into mixed modality training those percentages and rep schemes and total overall volume or somebody who's like just lifting so we really are like groundbreaking in this realm and i have 
looked at those charts for years and years and years, but then also through programming and just dealing with the thousands of athletes that I've dealt with, figured it out the hard way, quite frankly, as to like my percentage based charts. Okay, we're going to do a workout and this is the total volume of reps I'm looking to get in by the end of the workout. There's going to be this many rounds, which means per round, there's going to be this many repetitions of the particular lift. By the end of the workout, there's going to be this much volume that the athlete has been exposed to. These are the other movement patterns in the workout, which will negatively or positively affect what's going on with the barbell. And based upon that, this percentage makes sense. And it can be a percentage that allows you to keep going or a percentage that I know you're going to have to break it up in round three. And that's just been like that textbook doesn't exist. It really has been just in the trenches, lessons learned, eat, sleeping and drinking this stuff for a really long time and tracking it and, and paying attention to it. And so, um, yeah, there's not a singular guide out there that I think serves the functional fitness athlete well. So it's been my um, trial and error Frankenstein experimentation over the years to get to where we are now. So, and I think uh, um, everybody who did Monday's workout that had the percentage-based front squat little ditty <laughs> can see that over the course of the years, uh, that recipe has seasoned beautifully. So that's, that's about it. Uh, let's see. What is this? Matt, Matt R says, uh, I'm here for it. Oh, you must be the dancing with the devil thing. Um, Lynchpin and the Lynchpin and the BTWB app and you and boss have been a massive help as I've been focusing on building up my home gym and also uh, getting into it for the last eight months. Congratulations. Awesome. And Jim D. Hey, Pat, do you still eat turkey breast, strawberries and almond butter? Uh, kind of. Uh, kind of turkey breast or chicken, strawberries for sure, and the almond butter I've been replaced. I have this jar. I think it's from the Primal Kitchen. It's mayo that I put on like the chicken or turkey breast or whatever, but it's just made with avocados and maybe like uh, olive oil or something like that. So there's like two ingredients. Maybe there's salt in it, but it's mayonnaise, but it's just avocado mayonnaise, which is delicious and awesome. You know, when you look at the ingredients in that, and there's like two ingredients and they're real food versus like a, a regular jar of mayonnaise, which is 28 ingredients. And none of them are real foods. It's, it's awesome. So, okay, that's it. Um, thanks to everybody for being awesome. Enjoy your day. It's Thursday, right? It's a rest day. So that's it. Have a great day and we will talk later.